let's not waste any more time, guys. Let's jump right into our first guest. You know him as Kevin Smith, Mr. Kevin Smith. How's it going, man? Good morning. How are you, man? Happy uh, Comic Con or Happy Con. I guess you know, say Con because that's owned by another property. But happy Mainframe, Happy MF Comic Con, which actually sounds more metal. Yeah, exactly. It's the worst place to get stuck on a Sunday than in the middle of a comic book shop. We're having a blast here. Um, well, well, I've been asking all of our guests so far sort of how they've been handling uh, their social quarantine. Uh, you have to be uh, having a harder time with it. You just got off six to eight months of living on the road, pumping uh, the Reboot Road Show. What's it like going from life on the road to life in the house? How's it treating you? Yeah. It's only four months, man. Uh, but but uh, eight months makes me sound like a rock star. Uh, it was four months on the road. We did from October to December, and then we were down for Christmas, and then uh, January through February. Our last day of the tour was February 26th in New Orleans, the day after Mardi Gras. So we were in all the places where there have been like huge flare-ups, uh, oddly enough, and stuff. Yet none of us who were on tour, and there was only three of us, sometimes four when Jason was there, none of us got sick. So at the end of the tour... Um, I was coming home. I had a few days and then I was going to go back out into the world to uh, South by Southwest. They had a, a, a there's a documentary of my friend made about me uh, called Clerk that was debuting there. Then I was going to go back east to do some shows and stuff. Um, and then suddenly the, everything started getting canceled. And I'll be honest with you, like as I was coming home from tour, I was like, man, if I just had like one month to just sit around the house and like catch up on writing, get my eating straight go hiking every day like oh it'd be so perfect and then that happened so in the midst of all this i know like it's a bad reason but like i've welcomed the opportunity to just be home man and uh, it's allowed me to get to some writing so i finished writing uh, the mall rats sequel twilight of the mall rats and then this morning and yesterday since you know i'm waiting on feedback from the people that i sent that script to i was like you know what i'm going to dive back into the Moose Jaw script. So it's been like four years since I touched that. So now I'm kind of diving back into that as well. Just trying to make use of the time, man. There's, you know, it's, it's, of course, we all like to be able to do whatever we want to do, walk around, do whatever, leave, you know, being American is all about, I'm going to get my car and do whatever the fuck. But, you know, in this time where, you know, uh, unprecedented time, as they keep saying, um, where we're living in a moment of history, uh, I, I, you know, there's not much we could do except take it in, watch a bunch of programming, which is like what I've been doing for a while, eat, which I've been doing a bunch of, or try to be productive. So I'm trying to be productive, use the time to get some words on the page because one day they might let us go back to work. And if that's the case, I want to be ready to go with something. Man, you, well, you mentioned Twilight of the Mall Rats. You, we just saw that announcement on your Instagram. I believe it was a uh, Friday night or maybe Saturday morning. Uh, huge, huge. I mean, we've been talking about that since what, like 2017. Um, let where are we at, man? Like, like, let's dive into Twilight of the Mall Rats. It is. I'm apologizing. I'm obsessed with my hat because I don't have my my real hat. Um, <laughs> I, I grabbed the hat that I go hiking in, and it's smaller. I thought that looked familiar. I feel weird um, with that. Uh, in any event, uh, I had written a script for a Mall Rat sequel uh, a couple of years. God, it looks so crooked. I look like I'm like trying to put on attitude like this, but <laughs> where's my head crooked? Um, it looks good. Does it? Think? Well, not good, but uh, I, in my head, I look better. But in any event, I, I tried to write a, a Mall Rat sequel years ago called uh, Mall. Uh, what was it called? Um, Mall Rats 2 colon Die Hard in a Mall. Um, and it was predicated on an old idea I had back in like 1995 when we were making the original Mall Rats. And Jim Jacks, the producer, was like, you better have a sequel ready to go because this movie could be a hit. And I said, oh, I got one ready to go. He said, what is it? I said, Mall Rats 2 Die Hard in a Mall. And he's like, oh, that's perfect because they're making a bunch of Die Hard knockoffs at that point. So a couple of years ago, my friend Jim Jacks, that guy who was the producer, he passed away. He's the guy that introduced me to Stan. He's the guy that got Stan into mall rats. Jim Jack's new Stan. I had written a scene for a comic book guru that Brody would speak to. Then when Jim read the script, he was like, who's this meant to be? And I was like, well, in, in the real world, it would be like a Stan Lee. And he goes, why don't you just write it for Stan Lee? And I was like, well, I don't know Stan Lee. He's like, well, I do. And I was like, Hollywood is good. These fuckers know <laughs> each other. So I, I, uh, through Jim, 
you know, mall rats became reality and, and he was like uh, 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 partners in crime with me and Scott Mosier and putting that movie together and stuff. Uh, one of us, like, even though he was way older than us, he was like 50 and we were like in our late twenties. He, he, he was one of these cats in the business that going years back, believed in the comic book movie because Jim grew up reading comics. And that was why he knew Stan. He had worked at Universal for years and as, as an exec, and he ran a company called Alphaville with his partner, Sean Daniel. They did Dazed and Confused. They did Tremors. They did Tombstone and stuff. So he knew Stan because when Jim wasn't from Hollywood or anything, he think he was from Virginia and he was meant to be an engineer, but he aggregated into the movie business because he was a big fan. When he got out here, he would take Stan out to lunch once a month because he Jim loved comics as a kid. And he was just like, why isn't this guy's uh, universe? Why all his movies? How come they're not making? He's got to be a resource worth tapping. Um, plus, he just liked hearing old Stan and Jack stories and Stan talking about the bullpen. So he would take him out all the time, hoping like, yeah, maybe one day something will come of this or something like that. And what came of it was him going like, oh, the, this kid I'm making a movie with, he's got, it's set in comics, you're a comic book guy, brought us all together. So when Jim passed away a couple of years ago, I was like, I'm gonna finally make that movie in Jim's memory. And I wrote the script for a very different Mallrats sequel, uh, Mallrats 2, which more closely resembles what Jay and Silent Bob reboot became because I literally stole the third act from that old Mallrat script and put it into reboot when I was writing reboot, man. I was like, well, this script's never going to happen, but there's some good shit in it, including like Iron Bob. So I'm going to take that and use that as the third act for Jane Silent Bob reboot, change names and shit like that. But boom, it won't be wasted. So I was starting to hack up that script for parts and stuff. And I realized too, that like, that version of a mall rat sequel, as much as I loved it, because it literally was just like terrorists come and take over the mall and Brody yeah. to John McClane. And, you know, they were Canadian terrorists and shit like that. So it's goofy as fuck, but like I had a blast doing it. Problem is, if you walked into a movie theater and that was the mall rat sequel and you're like, what? What is what does this have to do with mall rats? Mall rats was literally a movie about two dudes bombing around in the mall who get broken up with, and then they get to go back out with their girlfriends at the end. Like, it, even in an escalation, like that as a sequel wouldn't make sense. Made more you know, like sense in the world of Jane Silent Bob reboot because Strike Back was a little more antic. But even though there's some like heightened reality to Mallrats, it is pretty straightforward day in the life movie. So I put that one to the side. And then when, uh, you know, I, it, like it didn't really matter because nobody wanted to make it. I was trying to make Mall Rats, that version of Mall Rats with Universal. They had no interest in doing it. Then we tried to do it uh, with Universal Television. Um, and they we went to three places like Netflix, Hulu, and I forget the other place. And each time, man, oh, it was Showtime. I sat down at Showtime to pitch. Um, Cause I remember I got real emotional crying about Jim Jackson. I was like, this is probably not a smart way to start a pitch. <laughs> So, especially for a comedy, no less. So, after tr pitching three places for the Mall Rats series, every time you walked in the room, the young execs were like, Oh, I loved Mall Rats. I, I love Mall Rats as a kid. I used to watch it all the time. And then you're like, Great. Well, here's Mall Rats too. And all of them just like, Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Like, is that, that's Mall Rats too? Oh, my God. <laughs> and so it never really went anywhere. So, uh, I put that to the side. I got frustrated because I was like, Well, if you know what with universal was lovely they you know when i brought in the script i was like i want to do mall rats two here they were like we own mall rats one like <laughs> you know it's not a huge cattle a title in their catalog it wasn't jaws it wasn't american pie we didn't in my world mall rats is huge with my fans mall rats is huge but in universal they literally had no idea that it was theirs and so when i gave them the script they were like this is universal, man. And I'll tell you something right now. This script is neither fast nor furious. So like they had no interest in making Jane Silent Bob uh, reboot. They had no interest in making, uh, uh, I mean, Mallrats. Later on, Universal came in on Jane Silent Bob reboot and took international. So they paid for half the movie and had it overseas, released it everywhere that wasn't America and stuff. So at that point, I was working with a guy named Jasper, who was our boss at Universal. And he was like, 
you know, we had this meeting. We came out to watch the flick and stuff at, at, at my house. And then we went to grab lunch. And he was like, movie turned out great. James on Bob reboot. He's like, movie turned out great. Go figure. In this real, like, fucking surprised way. So he was like, what do you want to do next? We like working with you cats. We, you know, we'll, you're on time. You pay your bills. Like, everything's great. What do you want to do? Like, you got any ideas? And I said, there is a movie I would like to make that you guys have. And he goes, well, write up a two pager and let's get to work. And so that's when I went back in on a mall rat sequel that had to more closely resemble the first mall rat. So gone is mall rats to die hard in the mall. Uh, as of December, like uh, mid December, right after Christmas, I started writing twilight of the mall rats. Um, and I finished it on what Thursday, Friday, uh, and had a blast. Uh, it's funny. It's uh, sweet. It's like, uh, kind of, you know, it, it's set against the mall apocalypse. Like mall culture was already dying before uh, the outbreak and before, you know, the pandemic. And now post pandemic, they say malls are in a going to be in a real bad way and start closing left and right. So suddenly that gets woven into the story. You know, at one point you're like, well, do you want to bring up COVID in the movie? Cause it's a movie. And like, isn't that where people go to escape? But this is a, like not even a generation defining moment. This is a history making moment. You, you're never going to be able to make some kind of movie set in reality without some sort of like reference to or post COVID kind of notion in a movie. Even if nobody has a conversation, like remember the COVID, like people in masks, like whether or not people will be shaking hands in the future. Like clearly this is impacting. So as you're writing a story that you hope to tell in the future, you also have to pull in those details from the present and one of my friends nate read the script and he was just like it like it threw me that i ran into covid in the script he's going but like i guess it makes sense and i was like i don't think anyone's ever going to be able to not address it like in media in the future you know in fact it'll probably be like in everything for a while because we're all just coming through it think of how many like quarantine movies folks are going to make if they're not making them already while locked up in their houses and stuff because it's a universal experience now that we all share that's what pop culture references are man that's why like you could drop a reference to iron man and in your movie and people are like yeah we all know that corona and this quarantine is now known by everybody you don't even have to like know marvel movies to know that reference so it's it's a, it's a reference like sex it's a reference like death like it's a reference like being born it's now a universal experience. It's got to weave its way into the work, I imagine. It certainly wove its way into mine. And that's not saying that everything I write now is going to be like, you got to talk about it. But this is the first thing that I was writing and presumably the first thing I would make if we ever are allowed to go back to work. It's it's set in a mall, which, yeah, malls are dead right now. But for our purposes in the movie, there there is a crowd in that mall. And like, we don't even know if you'll be able to shoot a crowd or something like that. So maybe that gets changed as well for a so socially distancing crowd within the mall, who knows, but you can't just assume that everything's going to look the way it did before this all happened. So it started we weaving its way into the work, man. Uh, but I love the script. I had a, such a good time writing it. And it is like 180 degrees from the mall rats to die hard in a mall thing. But very, very on point for you know, that was the thing. I became obsessed with like, you know, like these movies are I view them differently than other people. They're like my kids. But at the same time, like now, as I get older, I can play with them in different ways. Like, you know, years after we did a clerks, we did a clerks, too. So you get to like take those characters like into a different place in their lives. And most times when you make a sequel, it's usually right after the success of the first one. And you're capitalizing on that and trying to make as much money as possible. I make sequels years after it's marketable and, you know, doesn't really help the cause at all. And it's almost like restarting an engine and trying to start everything up over again. But um, for me, like going back and playing with Brody again, like which we did a little bit in Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Um, but having Brody now firmly like spending 90 minutes with him, with his point of view of this world and this culture, like one of the exciting things about that scene in Jay and Silent Bob reboot to me was I got to let Brody talk about Marvel movies, which was something he never could do in 1995. In the Twilight of the Mallrats script, he gets to do that about like everything, everything that like, 
uh, he hasn't been able to address in 25 years because he hasn't been in a movie or something like that comes to bear in Mallrats as his world is crumbling. It's kind of like, you know, Brody is uh, Jor-El and the mall is Krypton. And uh, I guess he's less Jor-El. He wants to stay on the fucking planet. Everybody <laughs> else is Jor-El and, and Brody's trying to maintain. Uh, but he's got to accept the fact that, like, you got to put the baby in the rocket sooner or later. So you're, you're talking about Brody. Um, what about uh, people like Brandy Spinning, TS? Is LaFour's going to make a, a return? I mean, what, what? The whole cast list. Brody's back. TS comes back. Um, Re, uh, Renee comes back. Um, Willem comes back. Svenning comes back. Uh, Trish, the dish, is back. Um, Jay and Silent Bob are back. Brandy comes back. Is that everybody? I think I, I, I mean, literally, I, I, I was right in the movie. I kept looking at the poster and being like, all right, they got to come back. Like if they're on the poster, they're, they're familiar to the audience. And if they work into the story as well. And it was nice to be able to work everybody like into the story, like, uh, you know, and, and updated. Willem is kind of now LaFour's. I don't even know if you've seen Ethan in real life, but he's fucking jacked. Like, really? Oh, he's ripped as fucking shit. So now he's become the mall security guard and stuff. Um, like every, everybody gets a, a role. And the story is like, uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's rooted firmly in reality, but it's completely plausible. Like, you know, every movie should be heightened, right? Otherwise you're just watching real fucking life. But at the same time, like for me, it's always important to make it like somewhat plausible. Like this could happen. Well, aside from Jay and Silent Bob swinging around on ropes and fucking mall rats, like, you know, mall rats is plausible, could happen, shit like that. Um, I tried to keep that with with this as well. And the um, the plausibility factor, like, oh, it, this could happen. Like Jay and Silent Bob reboot, once you get in like the Russian terrorists and <laughs> Iron Bob and bullets and shit like that, you know, then it becomes like a fantasy and stuff. But I'm not saying mall rats is like, oh, it's like Ken Burns Civil War. But I'm saying it's like, at least rooted in a reality that we all kind of see and understand. And then there are moments that heighten that reality. Um, Jay and Silent Bob have the most heightened reality moments in all of mall rats. Their shit is very absurdist uh, that I came up with this time. Cause I just spent a whole movie with them. So I didn't feel like I was going to overdo it with them in mall rats. Particularly if you look at mall rats, the original they're you know, you count the minutes they're in it. They're not in the entire fucking movie. They pop up as comic relief. So they function very much like that in in Twilight of the Mallrats as well. Um, and we don't like uh, have a game show in the third act, but the third act has an event that brings everybody to the mall. I mean, the whole movie is quasi set at the mall for a reason. Um, so it, like a, a, a damn good reason, because otherwise nobody would fucking be there. So um, we just kind of compound, uh, you know, the the. the uh, kind of nutty nature of it but it is still rooted in reality it's not like martians show up and brody's got to take them oh man i know i'm not that creative <laughs> i want to ask you i mean i, I know twilight uh, the mall rats is your big thing you're working on right now uh, a couple weeks ago you did announce uh, some plans for a clerks three yeah yeah um, so my, i know you probably can't talk much about it but i'm curious because you've said on record that uh, how and I totally agree how beautiful and poetic the ending of Clerks 2 was. It was just a lovely ending. You, you know, you said how that's how you wanted it to end with that dolly shot turns to black and white. You got the milkmaid. I mean, all that stuff. What made you kind of want to go back to, to Dante and Randall? Oh, I was, I mean, look, you, you can end a movie with a lovely shot and be like, ah, that's good. But like, you know, once Jane Silent Bob Strike Back was meant to be the end of the Vusk universe. That's why. God closes the book after the credits are all done. Lannis pops up, closes the book, and it's like, we're done forever. Um, and then, like, years later, when I went into Clerks 2, I wanted to grab Lannis to open it up with her opening the book, you know. Because if you look very closely, and this is so stupid, but in Jane's on Bob Strike Back, God closes the book at the end of the movie. But the book is halfway done. It's not like you got to the end of the book and shit. So I always left myself, like, this back alley of, like, no, 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 there's still more stories to tell. Um, Clerks 2, I love that ending shot and I love pulling into black and white, but the whole story of Clerks 2 is about like, uh, seizing your destiny. Like, uh, you know, like I, I, I don't have to be somebody's employee. I could be my own boss and stuff like that, uh, taking charge. Uh, but the last shot of Clerks 2 is very much like, be careful what you wish for, because like, you know, you see them go like, we're going to do this and this is what we need in life. And this will be everything. 
And then as the camera pulls back and shit just goes to black and white, you realize that like, you know, is it, was that the greatest decision they'll ever make? Like that's what movies don't tend to do. Movies end on the note of like, this was great and everything will be great for, for all time. That shot communicates like, you know, they, they went far, they got out of that place. And then their idea of victory was owning that place. And then they, they, own it and they won and then they're sitting there going like did we <laughs> so that kind of leads into where we are in clerks three and clerks three we open with uh randall having a massive heart attack um i told jeff anderson that and he's like where'd you get that idea um he had a massive heart attack and uh when he when he's in recovery uh dante's there and uh randall's just like i almost fucking died tonight that was it like, I almost died. I'm 50 years old and I almost fucking died and I have nothing to show for my life. What, I own a piece of a fucking convenience store in New Jersey? This is bullshit. He's going, like, I, I wasted my entire life. I sat around watching movies my whole fucking life. Never built anything. And when I die, who's going to fucking talk about me? I never got married like you did. I don't have a fucking kid and shit. I'm alone in this fucking world. And he goes, well, no more, man. As soon as I get out of this hospital, I'm going to go home. And I'm going to write a fucking movie about my life, celebrating my fucking life, telling my fucking story. And we're going to shoot it in that fucking store and you're going to help me. And so Dante and Randall essentially make clerks. That's what clerks three is about. How oh my God, that, that's so exciting. So that's the opening. And then from there on in, like there's a lot of, you know, there's ups and downs and epic shit happens. Like that's what I like to do is uh, stories, uh, particularly in the view universe, generally speaking, Jay and Silent Bob stuff being exceptions, like uh, uh, exceptional stories about unexceptional people living in, in a very unexceptional world like you know you don't look at a convenience store movie and go like that'll have the answers and shit but like it did for a bunch of people uh you don't look at the mall and go like that'll fucking have a lot of answers but for some folks it does people that i love that i love to write about like me when i started this job came from places that don't normally get celebrated in the media like i remember siskel and ebert when they reviewed the movie i think it was roger ebert was just like this is about a guy working at a convenience store. He's going, you go to the movies, they tell you stories about kings and fucking heroes and shit. You never see a story about some dude just working a job. And, and that impacted me. Like when he said that in the review, I was like, yeah, that's what I do. I tell stories about people that have real jobs or, or weird jobs. Not like it's never like this motherfucker is the sexiest guy in the world. It's like this guy is a comic book penciler. And this guy is an inker. And if you don't know what that is, you're going to learn over the course of this movie and stuff. So I, I always felt like because I came from a world of, for lack of a better description, interesting jobs. You know, when, when you're it, making movies is not what I would call an interesting job. It's, it's rarefied. It, it's like it's for spoiled fucking adult children and shit like that. Uh, working a real job, like when you're dealing with the public and stuff, like working at a convenience store, that's like reality. Um, and that was my reality. And I thought that would be my reality my whole life. So when I wrote Clerks, it was me writing about my life to lionize my life, but never thinking that like, oh, OK, I'll wind up doing this more than once. I just want to do it fucking once. And that was like 26 years ago. But that's still baked into my DNA. And now that's not to say, like, thank God there are filmmakers that don't base their shit in reality. Otherwise, we wouldn't have fucking Star Wars, right? Like George Lucas, his first movie, aside from THX 1138, which is a special uh, sci-fi movie, but his first movie that everyone sees and, and he gets loot for and acclaim for is American Graffiti. It's a day in a life about the life he grew up living. It's his clerks, for lack of a better description, his uh, days to confused. Um, but, you know, of course, way better and, and way had a far deeper impact on the culture than anything I've ever done. Think about it. Uh, American Graffiti gave birth to fucking Happy Days. Somebody else was like, I'm going to do that as a fucking TV show, which gave birth to an entire industry of sitcoms, Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Minnie, so forth and so on. So at the end of the day, like um, having American Graffiti, like George Lucas with that big success could have been like, all right, I'm going to make movies in Modesto about growing up and fucking being a, like a now the next stage of life or fucking blah, blah, blah. But instead, thank God, he was like, I, you know, I want to make a movie about Wookiees and it takes place in fucking space. I'm going to use my imagination. I'm not one of those cats. I don't have a big imagination shit, nor do I have a lot of com confidence in my ability to attract an audience to tell a story. So I never go like, let me put my shit in space. 
you know, I generally go like, well, uh, a mall, that's a big special effect. That looks like a movie. You know, right. and I go, I tend to, that direction. Uh, well, we're waiting on Boss Logic to hop on into the back uh, back uh, room here. So, Boss Logic, if you're watching, please hop on. You're up after Kevin. So, I thought I'd take a second to sort of open up at least one or two questions from the live chat. Um, let's do it. But means let's go. Probably won't be here when it happens. But like that Boss Logic stuff. Well, one of the simple joys of my life um, has been, particularly during the quarantine, uh, jumping on Twitter and seeing him throw up designs for movies that don't exist for movies that are about to exist he did a poster for dr strange 2 that i think had brother voodoo in it and i was like <gasps> and yeah, we don't even know like, if brother Voodoo's in the movie i don't crazy know dream catcher and stuff hanging from it oh my god it was so gorgeous i, I love our, other people's are i can't draw for shit and i'm no good with graphics and i'm about as good at drawing as i'm at directing and shit so i love when i could look at somebody's shit and it like grabs me where I'm like, oh, you can just get lost in an image like that. And then it's also so shareable too, where you send it to people and they're like, did you see fucking brother voodoo in this? It was very cool. Yeah. Well, we got the first one from Tim uh, uh, Bell Vance says, Kevin, what comic book uh, film hasn't been made that you'd like to be involved with? Oh, I don't know if I'd like to be involved. I don't, I love seeing these movies. I, I'm not, I don't want to make those movies. That's hard. <laughs> I've talked to people that make those movies. Sounds hard. Sounds very time consuming and shit like that. Um, plus if you make one of those movies and then you fuck up, you're never allowed to talk about the rest of them. You know what I'm saying? Like people, I could be like, Hey, I like the latest Batman. They'd be like, fuck you. You ruined the last Batman. If you were that guy. So I, I never think about making those movies. That's my happy place. That's where I go to escape. Like when I'm like, I want to go to the movies. That's, that's where I like to go. So I never look at them and go like, Ooh, I want to do that. Or I should be doing this. That being said, there is a comic book. That being said, I want to be in any Marvel movie. I don't care about making them. Put my fucking fat ass in a Marvel movie. They could see you, and that's that's all I care about. Like otherwise, you got to make that shit, and that seems hard. Talk to the Russo brothers. But a movie that somebody should make, I don't even need to be in it. But I think it would be a fantastic uh, film. Uh, and it's just, and the premise is made. Most comic book stuff is very much made for cinema or made for you know presentation it's it's fantasy it's graphic and and they do things that you can't really do in the real world that's why i like seeing spider-man swing is so breathtaking because you don't see that shit in the real world they take that from a comic book page that's a comic book notion even if somebody had web slingers they probably couldn't go as fast as peter parker does and stuff that's what makes it fun the dream prospect um dc got a character called the question which i always thought was tailor made for like a film noir because at its center you have a very inexpensive story of mystery right like somebody somebody did something to somebody else you got to figure that out and that's not a very costly movie to make what you have going for you with the question though what makes it catchy it's hook is that vic sage or renee montoya whoever you go with take the uh face putty uh from his belt uh, the pseudoderm spreads it on his face, releases gas from his belt. The pseudoderm affixes to his face and suddenly he's featureless. That is cinematic. You can see that fucking scene. And if you're somebody committing a crime or even if you're a good guy and you turn around and some motherfuckers behind you with no face, you would lose your shit more so than you would lose your shit. If you saw a guy dressed like, like a bat, you'd be like, fuck a bat. This, this, this supernatural freak has no fucking features. I'm, I'm terrified. So I think you could do the question very easily and kind of like, you know, the way they just uh, Blumhouse uh, did uh, uh, Invisible Man. Like that's a movie where it's not that expensive. I think the budget was like seven million bucks because, you know, your big special effect in that movie is the suit when they eventually show it. But most of the time it's the lack of anything in a frame that is the special effect. It's like you realize invisibility is the cheapest special effect on the planet. But the budget's kept low because it they don't it's not like a you know there's constantly showing how the suit works or something like that. In the terms of the of the question movie, you can do this shit with the face, what five times total in a two hour movie max. That's your only special effect, and and also this doesn't it, the it affixing to his face probably CG, but you could also just make. A fucking mask and and then you know rubber prosthetics like in the old days and then you know it's not even 
costly. It's not even costly on a CG level. Although I'm sure some CG person would tell you like erasing people's features. That's probably, you know, cheap. I don't know. I but, don't know. You saw Justice League. It's, yeah, sure. it, it, it's not easy <laughs> to erase facial it features. Like, it would look like an Henry Cavill mustache shot for like all moving along. Um, that's the one that I'm rooting for. And I remember, you know, I've been involved with uh, DC over the years and stuff like that. Years ago, me and Jeff Johns were talking about doing a series for CW. And we met at DC with his cat, Porn Sack, and we would come up with the show, um, that what it would be. And the problem with making the, the show had everything to do with, uh, at that point, it must be cleared up by now, but the rights to Rorschach, since Rorschach was owned by DC and, and he was kind of quasi based on, on the question and Charlton was owned by DC, but I guess some people were saying like, well, wait, that doesn't include uh, it, it. For whatever reason, legally, they hadn't done that yet. Like it always, like, I was like, why, why is it the question in something? And it had something to do with tie up, right? I mean, he's in the cartoon, don't get me wrong, but in a movie or something like that. So I, I don't know if they've cleared that up or something like that, but I honestly feel like, you know, I, I get making Wonder Woman 84. Wonder Woman was a great movie. Uh, like Patty Jenkins is amazing. The characters uh, stellar proven at the box office and stuff. And she's larger than life. She's a goddess. So of course you make that huge. Um, you know, you, you make a question movie for under 10 million bucks you're gonna you're buying a ticket <laughs> who's not buying a ticket you know? like it's i'm not saying everybody goes to every single comic book movie we've seen that's not necessarily the case but you got a strong brand behind it the dc label and stuff and if you cast that right you know like somebody everybody loves like keanu reeves or something like that how does that movie not work it's a cool concept visually interesting just cast it right it's home free and then since you know, it's episodic. You could do a whole series of those. They don't even have to be expensive. Great, great question. Uh, I forget if you even knew who asked that question in the conversation. Well, we got Boss Logic backstage. Kevin, we, we like to invite you back. We're here all day. We got Ming Chen on later on today. If you want to hop back in, we have an oh, open invitation. Ming we have Chen. the comic book man, Ming Chen. One uh, of my favorite comic book men, if not my absolute you, You've got the link. Hop on anytime today if you're getting bored. I mean, everybody would love to have you on a panel. So hop on anytime you want. We're going to go ahead and give it up to uh, Kevin Smith, guys. Give a big virtual round of applause. Kev, thanks so much. You're welcome all day long. Feel free to just hop on in. Real quick before I go. Yeah. That moment in, uh, you know, it's Avengers Endgame anniversary. The moment where, Doc, where Captain Marvel gets knocked out and Tony looks all panicked. And then he looks to Doctor Strange, and Doctor Strange goes like that. What did that mean to you? I'm afraid to open up this this can, Kevin. It's not <laughs> I really that. am. Uh, it, it, to me, and I think I'm, that's it. I think you have to die in order to, to for everybody else to live. See, all right, uh, that seems to be how a lot of people have have read it. I <laughs> read it that way. I read it as him going. Remember that conversation where I said there's only one reality in which we beat this guy this is it and we just lost because uh -huh. cat model beat down and stuff so i never read it as him going this is it you got to do something i didn't see it as a call to arms i saw it as a panic going we are we're dead we're uh -huh. absolutely dead there's no hope at this point um, I'm so curious what other people think. Man, well, 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 that'll be the recurring question throughout the day here at Mainframe Comic Con. Kevin, thanks so much. You're welcome back all day long, guys. We're going to take just about a 60 second break as we queue up Mr. Boss Logic. We got a lot of great stuff for him, so stick around. More Mainframe Comic Con all day long. Thanks, Kevin. Bye.